I think I stopped there. Uh, and it's actually a perfect segue into a, a question for Greg about uh, how the EU uh, has perceived uh, China's reaction so far. So we know that relations have been a bit rocky for the past couple of years. Um, and how do you think that the, uh, China's reaction to Russia's war in Ukraine has contributed to that? Thank you. Uh, maybe just very quickly on the point that Marina made about uh, whether destruction of, uh, of, of the US with uh, war in Ukraine is useful for China. I think that one of the arguments that you can make uh, in, in that context is that it would be bad for China in the in the sense of the level of unity uh, that the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine has created. One of the things that China fears extremely when it comes to Europe is the idea of NATO moving into Asia Pacific. And we've seen greater coordination with Japan, with South Korea. So this is definitely a fear on the Chinese side and we're happy to, to, to talk about it uh, later on. But if we take a look at the EU's reception of, of China's reaction to, to the Russian invasion, generally speaking, obviously it's negative, but it has had uh, quite an impact on the relationship in 2022. If we take a look at the, uh, especially the EU-China summit uh, in 2022, that was basically the summit in which the EU was trying to draw a, 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 a line in the sand for China when it comes to engagement with Russia. Well, now fast forward to where we are today, and the situation looks slightly different. We're in the moment when um, the question of the war was added to the pile of issues that EU-China relations have. But right now, while it remains very important, we're in a moment of tactical stabilization between the EU and China to a certain extent. I think it's going to be a very short-lived moment, but this is... Uh, kind of a response to the diplomatic offensive that we've seen from the Chinese side, uh, also with the new ambassador Fu Tsong coming to, to Brussels. Um, and the narrative that keeps coming from the Chinese side is the idea that there is a possibility to put the question of the war aside and basically treat the relationship between China and Russia as totally separate from relationship between China and the EU. This is not going to work. There aren't many takers in the EU, but there was this moment of those few months at the beginning of the year where, let's say, there was a bit of a warming. Also, now when it comes to the reaction to the uh, to the uh, China's um, China's position paper, while generally speaking it is negative, and you heard those comments even from Joseph Borrell, that was one of the main proponents of China as the mediator in the conflict, even if he criticized the position paper. But for example, the visit of President Macron that is upcoming to Beijing is sort of framed around the response to the position paper discussion about the role of China. So there is still some room for maneuver within that space. But generally speaking, I think that the way that the war is received and perceived now uh, in in the context and uh, in the context of china relations in europe we can draw a general line let's say uh with countries in central and eastern europe uh, and i'm sure that ivana will go to, into that in much more detail but um that the countries in central and eastern europe see it through much more through a security lens there is much more pro transatlanticism it's an issue that is much closer to home and then this gives you a strategic clarity about China supporting Russia to a certain extent, and that affects the relationship with China and this assessment. At the same time, in the, uh, let's say, the, the Western part of Europe, but uh, France, Germany, the Netherlands, there is much more thinking along the lines of economic security and that coming to the forefront of thinking. And this is what you see uh, in the context of discussions that have been facilitated simply by the repercussions of the war as well. So the discussions about how can we, let's say, diversify away from China to mitigate the risks, they're riskifying as the commission would want to call it. This is now very much on top of the agenda. So all of that doesn't mean that the, uh, the, the question of the war is, is not affecting the EU-China relations. It remains a key core roadblock and it's going to remain it, uh, especially if China decides to provide Russia with tangible military help and with tangible military aid, that's a red line. 
that much is clear. This is this is definitely the moment when the EU is going to respond in in force. But there is still room for maneuver with keeping the relationship with China stable enough at the time when the EU has been hit by inflation, by energy crisis. And there isn't just that many of takers in the countries that are not so close to uh, or don't share a border with Ukraine or are not in the region. Uh, they're, they're less eager, let's say, to, to push China strongly on that issue. So that would be more or less the picture with which I think China is also eager to exploit, as we've seen during the visit of Wang Yi to Europe in terms of those different, if we take a look at the countries that he visited, let's say, leaving Hungary aside as a special case as usual, uh, but, uh, you know, talking at Munich Security Conference, visiting France that has the uh, US skeptic leniences, and also discussions in Italy that also, generally speaking, the, the society is not that concerned about the war itself compared to the uh, the, the economic impact. So those are deliberate choices, I think, as well to, to try to divide Europe or create the contradictions as well within Europe. Yeah.